الان صحبت بکنم میتونیم تست کنیم مره مره so let's test the voice on the screen bigger screen Yo, you want me to talk to see if you can hear me <laughs> Yeah. Fernando. Yeah. We're gonna do the voice test for the screen. So. Sure. I mean, if you hear me. Over. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you perfectly. That's the name. Uh, Hello, hello. Good morning. Yes. Hello. Now it's perfect. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Bahir, I will have my phone next to me. If if anything happens during the presentation, uh, let me know. You, you can text me or let me know any way you want. Sure thing. Uh, good morning, Dr. Suarez. Good morning. Uh, it is a pleasure uh, to have you here with us. Uh, I know it's around uh, 5 a.m. Yes? In Spain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we can imagine it must be hard to present this early. So we are all uh, so thankful. And good morning to everyone, uh, dear colleagues, residents, students, and who have joined us. Uh, Dr. Suarez, it is an honor to be with you today. Uh, enjoy your uh, insightful lecture entitled Peri-Implantitis Prevention and Maintenance of Peri-Implant Health. Uh, all of us know there are many controversies uh, surrounding this topic, yes? And there are many challenges in this area and there is not a real uh, protocol or a consensus regarding to treatment planning of such patients, such disorders. So the moot question is, is perimplantitis curable indeed? And uh, we hope we can find many of our answers during this lecture. And regarding to this manner, I have to appreciate for this opportunity to be with you because I'm sure uh, we can get, we will get so much information uh, about this issue. But before starting the lecture, uh, I want to appreciate Dr. Khoshkam, uh, our dear uh, colleagues, our dear faculty member. Uh, who we have this opportunity. Dr. Khoshkam helped us so much uh, to, to make uh, arrangement, both meeting you and also setting the webinar. Uh, if you permit me, uh, I want, uh, as with the other lectures, uh, 
mention briefly your uh, worthwhile activities. And if, it, if it's wrong, you can correct it, okay? Uh, Dr. Suarez has been the adjunct faculty, faculty member of Michigan University, assistant professor of Oklahoma University, and also diplomat of American Board of Periodontology. And now he has his private clinic Madrid, in Madrid, Spain. Dr. Suarez, recently we, uh, many of our colleagues uh, had access to your informative book entitled uh, Periodontitis, the complete uh, summary. I think it's uh, the name. And uh, uh, we are proud because uh, we know Dr. Koshkom uh, cooperated to write with the team to write some of this chapter. Uh, reading and study of this book is highly recommended, especially to our residents and students. Uh, now, uh, if you permit me, I want to ask Dr. Koshkom uh, kindly run this online webinar. Dr. Koshkom, it is all yours. Dr. Suarez, we are all ears for your lecture. Thank you, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being with us. Dr. Suarez, I can't thank you enough to be with us at this time. I know it's so early uh, in Spain. Time is like 5 a.m. So thank you very much for accepting uh, uh, our invitation. It's really a pleasure and honor to be with you today. And uh, I won't keep the audience uh, waiting more. And uh, I will ask you to start your fantastic lecture. Excellent, excellent. Well, first, uh, the, thank you both uh, for, for inviting me. It's for me really uh, a pleasure to be here. I don't mind being awake at uh, 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m. <laughs> I don't mind. Thanks, it, is, it, is, it is really a pleasure for, for inviting me. I will, as I said, I will go ahead and start with the presentation, Bahid, and if uh, Dr. Koshkam, and if anything happens, um, let me know and uh, if anything doesn't work. So the title sure. of the presentation today is um, Perimplantitis. But I wanted to show something a little different because we have seen uh, over the last few years, we have seen a lot of speakers that they talked a lot about treating perimplantitis, how we can fix uh, perimplantitis once the problem is there, how we can regenerate bone or how we, we can do some, uh, some grafting around those implants. And I think it is, it is good timing to really think back and, and see if we can actually prevent those cases of perimplantitis that we can see that they can happen up to almost 50% of the cases. So maybe there is something else that we can do that can make this problem not so frequent. And uh, first I would like to start um, saying, as I always do, uh, although my remote doesn't wanna work, give me one sec because, oh, my presentation doesn't wanna move. What is happening? And I cannot exit the screen. Now, there we go. So as I always do with uh, with my presentation, I will you will see through this presentation that I actually talk about different implant system or different surfaces or different things. And I wanted to mention from the very beginning that I have absolutely no conflict of interest. The, the data that I'm gonna present is data that we have seen in our research or data that we have seen in, in, in some of the groups of, that are doing research around the world. So I really have no conflict of interest either way. And I would acknowledge that uh, it is not just me. It is a, it is a very big group of, of individual researchers and clinicians that we are working all over the world. And of course, uh, one of the main co-workers is Dr. Koskan. He, he, him and I, we have met already for almost 10 years and we have worked very closely. He's a, a great clinician, great researcher, and, um, and of course, a very, very good friend. And, um, and I would like to make a presentation by showing um, a couple of cases a few cases of preimplantitis. And this is a case that I saw back at the University of Michigan. And he came to the uh, periodontics department with the chief concern that one of the implants was moving. And I, when I saw this patient, they sent me this radiograph and they, they told me uh, there is, there's no bone loss, but we don't know why one of the implants is moving. 
And uh, when you see this radiograph, you, you can see very well the mandible, but you can really not assess whether or not those implants have bone loss. So when you take a different type of radiograph, you realize that the problem is a little different than what they thought it was. So this is a patient that we explain the situation. We let him know what is going on with his implants. And then he decides that um, if he loses those implants, he will not have any more implants never again. So if we can do anything to save those implants, he will be happy to do so. But he doesn't want to get into any very complex treatment or remove those implants. So we do some surgical uh, resective therapy. I actually wanted to extract more implants than that, but the patient uh, did not want to lose any more implants. We only removed the implant that was moving. And this is the situation after a year or two uh, after the surgical resective therapy of the implantitis. This is another this is a question by my friend and colleague, uh, James Mailoa. Uh, this patient had those three implants installed uh, very recently, almost like six months to a year before we saw this situation. As you can see, there is three implants, a splinted posterior mandible, and at least two of them have a very, very great amount of, of bone loss. So, of course, the patient did not want to lose those implants. And the potential for regeneration is really limited. Posterior mandible, very bad quality of tissue, uh, three implants splinted. So what he did in this situation is the similar type of therapy that we have seen in the case before. It is surgical resective therapy along with implantoplasty and trying to maintain those implants uh, for as long as possible, reducing probing depths and reducing inflammation. But of course, we do pay a great price uh, for this type of treatment with, with very big recession and exposure of the implant surface. And this is the last case I wanted to show as an introduction uh, for the topic today. And this is a patient that had a, a mandibular overdenture. The three uh, narrow implants were meant to be implants that were temporary only while the two regular diameter implants were also integrating. And uh, those implants were never removed. And this patient was never explained really how to take care of those implants. So this is the situation, the first time that I met this patient. And this is also a patient, she was a, a, a female in, in her 70s, uh, very nice patient, but she did not wanna lose those implants and she did not wanna start over with treatment. So we performed once again, surgical resective therapy. And here we have the results after three years. Uh, as we can see, a stable outcomes, um, a little bit of a lack of keratinized tissue, especially in those implants on, on the left side of the image, which is the right side of the patient. And uh, overall, very stable outcomes and the patient was very satisfied. When we look at these three cases, and uh, when we look at, at, at these photos of, of the final outcome of, of this treatment, I can't help myself but to ask, it is really success. I mean, are we really, are we really treating disease or we are just trying to prolong the life of these implants? Because uh, these three patients happen to be patients that they knew very well what, what was happening in their mouth. And they knew the treatment, they were explained beforehand that those implants will have significant recession. They will have exposure of the implant surface. But what will happen if these implants were located in the, in the anterior maxilla? Would this be a successful therapy? I bet no, I will not be happy if those were my central incisors in the, in the maxilla. So when we see these cases, we realize that preimplantitis, unfortunately, it is much more difficult and much more challenging than we see often. Nowadays, we all have social media, we all have seen presentations where, where cases, where we see a few selected cases, but unfortunately, but implantitis can be much more challenging than that and can be much uglier than that. Those results are definitely not aesthetics and it's definitely not ideal. But these are just my cases. And let's see, let's see another part of the evidence that when we see uh, speakers and we read about preimplantitis, we need to read about, about everything, not only about the good outcomes. Let's see if there is something else besides the good outcome. When we look at preimplantitis, we find that this is a topic that is, is, is very popular. Uh, we have done quite a bit of research along with Dr. Koskan uh, back in the University of Michigan. And we have done uh, a lot of my coworkers and colleagues are doing a lot of research uh, with parimplantitis. And when we see all these, uh, all this research together, there is a few main um, outcomes 
that we see. First of all, that there is no reliable evidence that suggests that there is a single most effective therapy. Uh, dose regeneration work, yes, it can work. Uh, dose resective therapy work, yes, it can work. Same thing with non-surgical therapy. So it's really case sensitive, case dependent. Uh, so everything works and everything doesn't work depending on the case, depending on the patient, depending on the implants. Um, we have seen that this is a topic that unfortunately has very high risk of bias. And the, the implant companies, they do have the interest. They do have their economic interest that goes beyond science and beyond what we can know. And unfortunately, this happened, especially in, in the implant field. We see a lot of research that indicate us that we need to know more. And finally, we have uh, quite a bit of, of decision trees, and these are just the recipe of what it works in their hands. But what we see people doing may or may know what works in our hand. There is also some research, for example, this is uh, this is specific research is looking at implant survival after the surgical treatment of preimplantitis. And we can see that at 10 years follow-up, they were looking at two different types of surfaces, titanium plasma spray and SLA surface. We can see success with the blue mark. Only 30% of those implants were considered successful therapy after 10 years. And with the other surface, 40% of the implants. That means that three out of seven implant success, no, three out of seven, no, excuse me, three out of 10, seven implants out of 10 were not considered successful after the surgical treatment of perimplantitis. And when we look at all the different type of research published more recently in 2020, they look at how many implants have disease progression after already treatment perimplantitis. It is important to know that this is surgical treatment of perimplantitis. And then we realized that 44% of the implants, almost half of the implants have recurrence of disease and have progressive bone loss. And when we look at what happened to those implants, we realize that the majority of those implants, the ones that have progressive bone loss, they had to be extracted, they had to be removed. So brain implantitis is certainly a disease that can be treated in specific scenarios. But when we look at the bigger picture, we realize that preimplantitis is a very challenging disease to treat. So in my opinion, when we look at preimplantitis and we look at the result of this therapy, we realize that oftentimes it's very challenging to treat and it's very case specific. It's not that we want to treat, it's that some implants and some patients are not good candidates for the treatment of preimplantitis. We also see that it's unpredictable in the long term. Preimplantitis seems to work very well for the first few years, but after five, 10, 15 years, Regeneration around teeth has been proven very predictable. Regeneration around dental implants have been proven less predictable in the long term. It is anesthetic, especially the surgical resective therapy with the exposure of the implant surface, and that can be a big, big problem, on the, especially in the anterior maxilla. And it also has poor long-term outcomes. We have seen how most of the implants relapse. Almost 50% of those implants after the surgical treatment of preimplantitis relapse over time. So in my opinion, and what I've been focusing over the last years, um, it's, it's something different than what we see in most of the meetings and most of the speakers, uh, is that I wanted to take a turn from the, from the normal progression of preimplantitis. Uh, from the beginning, we have paid a lot of attention to the treatment of preimplantitis. We have paid a lot of attention to the outcomes of preimplantitis. But I, what I wanted to do today with today's presentation is actually to take a step back and look at what are the factors that play a role in perimplantitis and see how we can prevent perimplantitis. And when we know these factors, we will be able to not only prevent the appearance, the occurrence of perimplantitis, but we will be able to better treat this inflammatory disease. So now the real question is how do we prevent Implantitis. If it were that easy, we wouldn't have that many cases of, of preimplantitis. And what we have to do when we are thinking about preventing a disease is, first of all, we need to know very well what we're working with. When we look at the latest definition of preimplantitis uh, in a consensus paper, the World Workshop by the American Academy of Periodontology and the European Federation of Periodontology, we realize that preimplantitis is a plaque associated pathological condition that occurs in the tissues that surround dental implants and is characterized by inflammation of the brain implant mucosa as well as progressive loss of supporting bone. So when we look at this definition of perimplantitis, we realize that there is a few main components of it. 
It's a condition that is plaque associated. Of course, there is always plaque. Sometimes plaque will be the cause of perimplantitis. Sometimes plaque could be the consequence of perimplantitis, not so much the reason why perimplantitis was initiated. But we see that this disease progress in the presence of inflammation and loss of supporting bone. So these are the two factors, these are the two targets that we should be looking at when we are trying to prevent perimplantitis and we are trying to treat perimplantitis. When we are looking at inflammation, we should be very careful about perimplant mucositis. Every perimplantitis starts with perimplant mucositis. It may go through a phase, a quick phase of mucositis, or it may have chronic mucositis for many months or many years, but every preimplantitis starts with inflammation of the preimplant mucosa. So why should we paying a lot of attention into that inflammation? We should prevent it from happening. And if it happens, we should treat it before we have progressive loss of supporting bone. And with regard to the loss of supporting bone, this is a topic that I particularly like quite a bit. Uh, this could be a topic of, of a whole different presentation as far as crystal bone loss. We really should be paying a lot of attention to bone remodeling, early bone remodeling, and this so-called physiological bone remodeling. This is, this is bone loss that happens early once we install the implants. And this is bone loss that for sure it will influence the presence of preimplantitis and the occurrence of preimplantitis. And the rationale is very simple. We cannot lose three, four, five millimeters of bone if we don't lose the first millimeter of bone. So we should be really putting a lot of focus into that crystal bone loss and trying to prevent it from happening as soon as possible the very day that we play plants. And for this, Dr. Koskan did an excellent job in the, in the book chapter, the book that we were just talking about, that I'll recommend you reading about specifically crystal bone loss and what are the different factors that play a role in this phenomenon. So now we know that preimplantitis is a very difficult disease to treat then it can often be uh, unpredictable in the long term, and it can often be uh, not aesthetically appealing. And, and these are the two main factors that we should be using, the presence of preimplant mucositis and, and crystal bone loss. So now what we are gonna do during today's presentation is to focus on the factors that play a role in these two phenomena to see how we can prevent current preimplantitis. Now with preimplantitis, one of the problems that I find is that it can be a very uh, overwhelming disease, meaning that there is so many factors that play a role in, in the presence of preimplantitis. And when we see with cases with preimplantitis, usually complex cases uh, with patients that some of them have implants for 25 years, some of them have implants for six months, and there is so many factors that play a role. And it can be overwhelming. When we start looking at these factors, we realize that there's a lot of factors that play a role at a local level. Preimplantitis is a site-specific phenomenon. Uh, we realize that there are many factors that play a role at the, at the patient level. Uh, so many uh, systemic diseases and conditions that can play a role in preimplantitis. We also realize that there is a lot of factors that are related with the, with the surgical part of implant therapy. And there are a lot of factors that are related with the prosthetic, with the rehabilitation part of, of implant therapy. And in order to make this presentation a little simpler, a little easier to follow, I have grouped these cases, uh, these factors into uh, factors related with the host, factors related during the surgical therapy of preimplantitis, during the rehabilitation phase, and finally during the maintenance and the long-term follow-up of this patient. So when we look at the host uh, patients, and this is something that we should evaluate prior to implant uh, placement, we're looking at different factors. We are looking at the susceptibility, and we should be thinking, is this a patient that is gonna give me problems in the long term? We should be looking at systemic factors. We should be looking at the knowledge of this patient, and this is something that is very often uh, forgotten, and we don't really pay attention to this, and also the presence of periodontitis. When we look at the surgical part of placing implants, the actual placement, we should be very careful with the 3D positioning. And this is something that we will discuss about. A lot of perimplantitis, a lot of problems that we see, uh, is, those are problems that we cause them in the way that we place the implants. When we look at, at the rehabilitation of the dental implants, 
we can see uh, that a lot of the cases that we have, it is not that the patients do not want to clean, it's the patient cannot clean. We focus so much into doing rehabilitations that look perfect, that we don't let patients clean around those prostheses. And finally, the maintenance. Once patients uh, have gone through the surgical phase, once those patients have been rehabilitated, that implant therapy does not stop there. We need to follow up these patients. We need to know what is happening. Otherwise, we will have for sure uh, surprises in the long term. So starting with the host, starting with the, with different factors that, that play a role at the, at the patient, patient level. The first thing that I consider very important, uh, and this is a research that I, that I really enjoy, that I will recommend you reading, is from uh, our friend and colleague, uh, Alberto Monge. And they did a, a survey at the University of Michigan, uh, patients with, uh, with dental implants, and they asked them a series of questions. Uh, the first one being, what is perimplantitis? Not surprisingly, we found out that three out of four patients did not know what is perimplantitis. And this is, even though it's a very simple question, in my opinion, is very relevant because how can patients be aware, try to prevent and take care of their implants if they don't know what they are facing, if they don't know what they have? Uh, patients, how can we ask patients to take care of their glucose level if they don't know they have diabetes? They need to know the problem so they can take care of it and they can be more proactive in our therapy. And uh, in this sense, they ask them a series of other questions that they ask them uh, five categories, actually six with the, with, the, with the category of I don't know, asking patients whether or not they very much agree, they very much understand what they would ask or if they have no clue at all. So they ask them, for example, add dental implants forever. And as we can see the great majority of patients agree that there are implants that are forever. And as we can see in our cases, and we can see on a daily basis, a lot of the implants are not forever. They really are not forever, or they could be there forever after the surgical treatment of perimplantitis. When patients would ask whether or not they know what causes perimplantitis, and we can see again, very mixed results. Some of them have no clue what causes perimplantitis. Some of them seems to know, some of them really don't know. They are somewhere in between. When they were asked whether or not bacteria causes perimplantitis, I believe this is a little tricky question because when you ask patients if bacteria cause something, we all know that bacteria is not good for your mouth. So of course they are gonna reply yes. And one of the latest questions, and it is very important again, is what is the supportive perional therapy that they need for their implants? And as we can see, once again, very mixed results. Some patients know, some patients don't know. So the bottom line is, and I know this is redundant, and I know this is something that we've been taught in a school, but the reality is many times when we see uh, when we see patients in need of dental implants, we jump too quickly into placing implants without patients really understanding what is happening. What do we do now when patients, when they have very poor oral hygiene and they have um, really not an understanding of what is uh, this inflammatory disease, not only perimplantitis, but periodontitis, and this is a very controversial topic, especially in, in, in United States. Uh, I don't know about Iran, but at least in, in Spain and United States, uh, there is quite a few of these cases that when we do uh, full mouth rehabilitation, uh, full mouth extraction with the maxilla, mandible, and, and mandible, and then uh, implant, uh, implant placement, four implants, six implants, eight implants, depending on the type of, of prosthesis. But these are cases that the patient need to understand what is happening is not whether or not we can place the implants. The question is whether or not we should be placing implants. Can we place the implants in a mouth like this? All of four type of prosthesis, six implants, maybe eight implants. Most likely we will be able to do, to do so. But the question should be, should be doing that. In a patient that had this mouth, this very poor home care, if we extract all those teeth and place the implant immediately, what do you think is gonna happen in six months, in 12 months, in 18 months? More than likely, if the patient is not explained what is happening, we'll have the same problem around dental implants. 
And why is the reason that it's a very simple, uh, it's a very simple reason. We all have seen this, uh, uh, what is the bacteria profile that we have uh, around teeth and around implants. And we can see how we move from the initial colonizers to early colonizers, to late colonizers, to different type of bacteria, how the bacteria is becoming more aggressive, how the bacteria as it grows is becoming uh, more detrimental to the peri-implant tissues. And we see a shift from gram-positive bacteria to gram-negative bacteria, to anaerobes, to staphylococcus, we can see how the bacteria is becoming more aggressive and more detrimental to the perional tissues. And this is the change that we see around the peri-implant tissues. So this is something that even though it's obvious, we really need to be taking care of this situation. And we really should be treating periodontitis before we move forward with dental implants. When do we test dental implants? I know when we see mouth like this, we are very eager. We really want to place the implants. We want to help our patients. We want to give them their smile back as soon as possible. But when we are placing implants, we should really do that after a series of treatment that we should do before. We should do systemic control. We should do hygienic control. The patient should know what is periplantitis, what is periodontitis. And once we have a stable periodontion, they we can move forward with dental implants. So what happens when we place the implants in these patients with periodontitis that they have previous history of periodontitis? We have plenty of evidence that shows that these implants in the long term, they will be losing more bone. They will have more peri-implantitis, whether it is for a local condition or a systemic condition that remains to be more researched and better identified. Well, we know that this patient implants in the short term, almost everything works. But when we look at 10 years, 15 years, 17 years, we realize that there is so much more biological complications in the peri-implantitis around patients that have a history of periodontitis. And now, as we all know, it's not only periodontitis. There are two main factors that also the American Academy of Periodontology and the European Federation of Periodontology talked about in the latest uh, World Workshop. And we know that smoking is a big factor related with periodontitis. So now the question is, uh, can we not place implants in patients that smoke? Of course, of course we can place the implants. I don't know about Iran, but in Spain, if we don't place the implants in patients that smoke, we, we just wouldn't place the implants. A lot of patients smoke here, not so much in the United States. So does that mean that we cannot place the implants? Of course not, but that means that we need to be more mindful. Those patients have to be enrolled in a very close monitoring of those implants. We need to do perional therapy, perional supportive therapy. We need to pay close attention to those implants. And when we look at perimplantitis, and different patients, patients that smoke and patients that are not smokers, we realize that the prevalence of preimplantitis is almost three times as much in patients that smoke. And this is no coincidence. Smoking is really a big factor into the prevalence and the incidence of preimplantitis. And the same situation when we look about diabetes. Patients that have diabetes are patients that are more prone from different reasons, are more prone to, uh, to have uh, preimplant inflammatory conditions. So these are cases, these are patients that are, we know are most susceptible to perimplantitis. So these are patients that we need to more closely monitor. And these are risk factors that our patients need to know before we move ahead with implant therapy. And finally, there is one of the factors that, are, that is really very research about and it's patient susceptibility. In the same way that patients, some of them are much more susceptible to perineal disease. As we know for the very classic studies by Lang and Lowe, the Sri Lanka tea workers in 1980s, some patients are very susceptible to, to periodontitis. Uh, bone loss occurs very quickly. Some others have a more moderate progression of the disease and some others, even though in the presence of bacteria and plaque accumulation with very poor home care, they have no progression of periodontitis. And this is something that more than likely happened also in patients with dental implants, but this is something that we should really do more research. We don't know much about. And now we're going to move into some of the factors that we should uh, be looking at when we uh, place implants, not so much at a systemic level, but a local level. And why are these factors um, important? Why should we be paying attention to that? And this is a study that was published in 2015 by uh, uh, Luigi Canullo. 
And uh, it's, a very, it's, a, it's a very important study because what they did is that they looked retrospectively at hundreds and thousands of implants. And they uh, were looking at implants with perimplantitis and they were looking at different factors affecting perimplantitis. And they divided, they grouped those factors into three main categories. Factors that were related with the surgical part of uh, implant therapy, factors that were related with the prosthetic part of implant therapy, and implants that were suffering from perimplantitis without any other factors playing a role, just purely by plaque accumulation without any other complications. So when we look at these factors, we realize very simple by looking at this graph that the most prevalent factor, almost 50%, was implant malposition. And this is a factor that we have control over. These are actually good news. When we look at the, uh, the three main factors, we realize that it's malposition, overloading, and more than four implants. These are actually good news. That means that most the factors that play a role the most times with preimplantitis are factors that we can control. So if we place the implants in a better position, if we take better care of our prosthesis, we can prevent a lot of these cases of preimplantitis. And as I was saying, when we look at these factors, we realize that most of them are related with the surgical part of implant therapy. A lot of patients are deemed to have preimplantitis just from the very moment that we place those implants in a wrong position. So we are actually today very fortunate. 50, 60 years ago, um, we didn't know much about implants and we were placing implants just whatever we have bone. We were placing implants as wide as possible, as long as possible. We don't do that anymore. We know that short implant works. We know that implants don't have to be as wide as possible. And we know that implant has to be in a prosthetically driven position. We know a lot today that we didn't know decades ago about implant positioning. And I'm not here to tell you exactly where you have to place the implant, but there are areas where the implant is in the right position, and there are areas where the implant is in the wrong position. There is not just one single point and angulation where the implant is right. It, it is a range, but we have to be within that range. We have to place the implants in the right position. For late implants, for immediate implants, if we place the implants in that situation, we know that it's a case that we are asking for a problem in the long term. We know those are cases that not only preimplantitis, we are going to have aesthetic complications. We are going to have a lot of different complications. And one of the, the, the parameters with regard to the 3D positioning of dental implants that I wanted to talk about, that I believe is very interesting, and we've been doing more research lately, and this is a, a, an article published in 20, uh, 2017 by Stuart Fromm and co-workers, and they were looking specifically at the 3D positioning at vertical component, whether it's implants were placed at the level of the bone crest or implants were, were placed subcrestally. And I am really a big fan of placing the implants a little deeper. The more that I know about preimplantitis, the more that I know about implant therapy, I've been placing my implants a little bit deeper lately than when I just started placing dental implants. And the main reason for that is that when we looked at marginal bone loss, in the exact same conditions in implants that were placed a little deeper, we realized that we may have a little bit more of that early crystal bone loss that we should be fighting. However, the surface of the implants, if we go a little deeper, may not be exposed, which is really the key. We want our surfaces of our implants, especially if it is a rough surface, we want that surface to be completely covered by bone. And even though in the group that was placed subcrestally, we have a bit more of marginal bone loss, those implants were never exposed. So what we should be looking at is mesiodistal, labiopelotal, and apical coronal positioning of our implants, always in a prosthetically driven position. What happens if we place an implant that is not in the right position? Remove the implant try to place it in a better position. And if we cannot, we will perform guided bone regeneration, close the flap, come back in again in three months. Don't be afraid. Many times we have all placed implants that we are not happy with. If that implant we know is gonna give us trouble in the long term, don't set yourself up for failure. Remove the implant, place the implants in the right position. 
Thankfully, nowadays, we have a lot of tools that we didn't have many years ago. We all know how to play C++ freehanded. That is actually the easy part of implant therapy. We all know how to do a hole in somebody's bone and place an implant. Today, we have tools that can help us be more accurate, whether it's a static guides or surgical navigation. Which one you want to use is completely up to you. Everything can work if we do it rightly, if we do it, if we follow the protocol. What is obvious, and nowadays we have evidence to prove, is that no matter how good we are placing implants, no matter how confident we feel, when we go for guided surgery, we tend to have better outcomes. We are more accurate when we use guided surgery. Whatever system you want to use, this specific paper was looking at a static computer aided, but we also have surgical navigation. Use whatever you want to use. But if you can help yourself with guided surgery, why not? Let's take a look at the implant tissues. I wanted to do a, a, a quick uh, overview of the, of the bone and the, and the soft tissue surrounding dental implants. And um, these are very important factors that we should be looking at when we place dental implant. And specifically with bone, the pre-implant bone thinness, this was published recently by, by Alberto Monge. And we look, we see that the buccal bone thickness, as well as the lingual bone thickness, they do have a huge role in preimplantitis, preimplantitis progression and treatment, and in the appearance of uh, implant dehiscences. If we have a thin buccal wall, we should be considering grafting or placing the implant deeper. But if we place the implants in a very thin buccal wall, more than 1.5, even more critical when we have more uh, no, less less than 1.5 or less than one millimeter, we should be considered doing bone grafting. Implants are really much more stable when we have adequate buccal bone thickness. And one of the parameters that I really enjoy about um, implant therapy is it's not only the bone that is surrounding the implants, but it's the peri-implant mucosa. And this is something that we tend to forget. As important as it is also integration, and we have the thick buccal wall more than 1.5 millimeters, the pre-implant mucosa, previously known as biologic width, now known as supracristal attached tissue, it is as important as the bone that we have uh, surrounding dental implants. And the two main factors that I wanted to talk about with regard to these tissues, and one of them is whether or not it's keratinized and attached tissue, and the other one is the vertical part of it. How is the thickness in a vertical dimension of these peri-implant tissues? With regard to the characterization, and this is really a topic that is, I'm not going to get into too much detail. We have a lot of evidence. We have a lot of research. We have prospective studies. We have retrospective studies. We have plenty of systematic reviews in implant therapy in the implant field that tell us that we need keratinized mucosa, keratinized and attached mucosa around dental implants. Otherwise, we will have more plaque accumulation more tissue inflammation, more recession, and ultimately more attachment loss. But the good news about this is grafting around the implant for the most part is actually pretty easy. If we don't have keratinized tissue, it is very predictable. We have many different ways of augmenting keratinized tissue around dental implants. This is uh, another research that was formed as far as the presence of perimplantitis in irregular compliers, these are patients that did not come to the office as frequently as they should have for pre-implant maintenance. And we realize that the prevalence of pre-implantitis in these cases, when they have less than two millimeters of keratinized mucosa, it is almost 50% of patients presented with pre-implantitis. In this very same cohort of patients, irregular compliance, when they have more than two millimeters of pre-implant mucosa or pre-implant keratinized mucosa, only 5% of perimplantitis. That means that the keratinized mucosa surrounding dental implant, it is very, very important, particularly in patients that do not comply with maintenance, patients with bad oral hygiene and patients that do not come regularly for implant maintenance. With regard to the vertical component of perimplant tissues, this is something very simple that we often forget about is that the, we have a biologic width around dental implants, now called supracristal attached tissues. And this is a number 
that is formed by the combination of three different components, which is the connective tissues, the junctional epithelium, and the sulcus. Every single implant exposed to the oral cavity will have these three components, sulcus, junctional epithelium, and connective tissue. And along the three of them, they will have a total width, a total component of somewhere between three to four millimeters. Why is this so important? Because if we don't have it, we will always have bone loss. This is a research that was performed in 1996, very critical, very important research by Berglund that we often forget about. And they placed implants bilaterally. It's an animal research dog study. And in half of those, uh, it was a split mouth designs. In half of those implants in one side of the mandible, they remove a critical part of that pre-implant mucosa. We can see how they thin it on one side and the other side had a much thicker mucosa. They let those implants heal for six months and they did histological analysis. What did they find out? Knowing that we have that biologic width, those three to four millimeters required. That means that when the mucosa was resected, and we have equal or less than two millimeters, bone resorption occurred. We need a minimum width of tissues. This is not keratinized tissues. This is the vertical component, the thickness, the height of those tissues. And if we don't have enough height, we will have bone resorption. The soft tissues will not grow vertically unless we graft them. If we don't have enough vertical component of the tissues, we will lose bone. It has been proven more recently again and again with a lot of research led by Thomas Linkevichus out of Lithuania. And they placed implants with the exact same protocol in thick tissue, medium thickness tissue, and finally in thin tissues. And they divide those into more than three millimeters, 2.5 millimeters on less than two millimeters. And we can see a huge difference in those tissues. And we can think, we may think that these it's a very minor difference, 0 0.4, 0 0.9, 1.5. But we already know the huge importance that these have on the presence of preimplantitis. We cannot lose five millimeters of bone if we don't start by losing one millimeter of bone. So the more that we can prevent this early bone loss, the better. And we should be really paying a lot of attention to this. Well, years ago, at the University of Michigan was, was the first one to publish a, a systematic review on this topic about the, the soft tissue thickness, the supracrystal height of the preimplant mucosa. And not surprisingly, we found out that the thicker the preimplant tissue, the effect on those implants. And when we have thicker tissue, we have less marginal bone loss. Let's talk a little bit about implant selection, and I want to remind you that I actually have absolutely no conflict of interest uh, with this regard. This is a very, this is a very um, tricky subject to study because there is, as we were talking at the beginning of the presentation, there is quite a bit of conflict of interest. And uh, but we did this research um, without any funding. We did this research without no conflict of interest whatsoever. When we place dental implants. Even though they all look uh, the same, pretty similar, root form, conical shape, the null implant, they all are not the same. We should be very mindful of the implants that we are placing in our patients because when we do research and we uh, create ligature induced preimplantitis, we induce preimplantitis in, uh, uh, in our implants. And this is, of course, a dog model. This would be unethical on a, on a patient. But we realized that some of the surfaces, they lose bone so much quicker than some of the surfaces. Does that mean that we cannot place that implant? Absolutely not. This is a particular implant that does work very well and is placed very, very commonly in the United States and in Spain. But this is maybe an implant that we should be more careful about. We should be really looking into all these different factors. Maybe we don't want to place this type of implant in somebody that is a smoker with diabetes, with bad oral hygiene. Maybe those patients, we don't add one more ingredient to that preimplantitis component. And we don't want to use that implant that is the one that has the most, is the most prone to have bone loss and preimplantitis. We realize that certain type of implants have greater defect depth with and greater bone loss in the exact same conditions. These are ligature induced model. These are the same conditions 
different implants side by side in the same animal. Not only the process on bone loss, but very importantly, the treatment of preimplantitis, we realized that four different implant systems, when we surgically treat preimplantitis, we realized how three different surfaces we are able to not only arrest the progression of preimplantitis, but we can even gain some bone. But there is a certain type of implant that we continue losing bone regardless of our best effort with the exact same treatment. So we know that the resolution of preimplantitis is possible, but the outcomes are influenced by the surface of the implant. And it's a research that we just accepted only a few months ago that we did uh, the very first systematic review on this topic. And uh, what we did purposely, we were only looking at an animal model. Why did we do that? We know the difference between animals and humans. We know there is a difference as far as healing and bone loss. But in animals, is the only way that we can study. We can do apple to apple comparison, the same implants in the same conditions and see how quickly they lose bone and how we can fix, we can treat that preimplantitis. And we realized that different implant system, different surfaces, they really do play a major role in preimplantitis, in the treatment of preimplantitis also. And not surprisingly, turn surfaces, commonly referred as a smooth surface implant, they do have the least amount of bone loss and do, they do have the most favorable treatment outcomes. I will not be surprised in years to come, we are gonna start using an implant system that is a combination of rough surfaces along with smooth surface or maybe the coronal half of the implant. So what has happened with implant therapy in the last decades? We have changed from a turn from a relatively smooth implant surface to a rough implant surface. Why have we done this change? We have done that to reduce marginal bone loss. We have done that to achieve better bone to implant contact. And we have very importantly done that to increase survival and success rate, especially in the maxilla, especially in the smokers. And we have really achieved that. Implants nowadays, the success rate is much, much higher than we had decades ago with the smart surface implant. However, we have paid a great price for it. And is that the prevalence of preimplantitis, it is much higher and is much more difficult to treat around these implants with uh, rough surfaces, different type of surfaces. And the last aspect that I wanted to mention with regard to this implant, and this is a topic that we've been doing quite a bit of research over the last years is the presence of titanium particles and preimplant diseases. And I don't wanna to get too deep into this topic. It's not, it's not pertinent to today's presentation, but we know, today we know that we have titanium particles around dental implants. And we know that these particles are more prevalent around implants with preimplantitis compared to healthy implants or even patients without dental implants. These particles, and not all the same from the different types of dental implants. And we know that some particle from certain type of implants can be more detrimental to the peri-implant tissues. We have an example of using two markers, check two and bracket one. And I will not get too deep into this topic, but what I wanted to show you is that certain type of implants, the titanium particles that they release upon placement can be more detrimental to the peri-implant um, uh, cell population to epithelial cells. And we were looking at these markers that check for uh, DNA damage around different type of particles coming from different type of implant system. And we realized the specific type of implants have a much more detrimental component in the epithelial cells surrounding these implants. Now let's move into the prosthetic part. Once the implants are placed, and assuming that the implants are placed in the right position, what are the different things that we can do to, to prevent these this peri-implant diseases? And when we look at the prosthetic, the first thing that comes to my mind is cleansability. It is very, very often that we see peri-implant diseases in patients that simply cannot clean. Even if they want it, they cannot clean. How are we gonna clean that prosthesis? Why would we do that posterior mandible? When we are dealing with implants, especially in non-static areas, we should be giving more priority to cleansability rather than the aesthetic component of it. 
especially this is not aesthetic whatsoever, but even if it were, cleansability comes first. We cannot allow our patients to not clean around these implants. This is a great example. Look what happens when we remove some of the prosthesis with a huge concavity. How is the patient going to be able to clean that? What do we do when we see prosthesis like that? If we treat these implants and we don't change the prosthesis, even in the best case scenario that we are able to arrest disease progression, it will happen again. If we don't give our patients prosthesis and rehabilitation that can be clean, we should change that for a more convex profile, something that does not accumulate that much debris, something that patients can clean. We find research when we look at a cohort of patients that whether or not they have access for hygiene or they have lack of access for hygiene, we realize, not surprisingly, that perimplantitis is very prevalent when patients are not able to clean around their implants. However, when patients can clean properly around their prosthesis, the incidence of perimplantitis is really, really low. So don't set your patients up for failure from the very beginning. Do prosthesis that they can clean. And if we install a prosthesis and it's not cleansable, change it. Change it because it will give you problems in the long term. And this is a research coming out of the University of Complutense here in Spain, in Madrid, where we find they did a, a, a study that they were looking at the treatment of perimplant mucositis with or without changing the prosthesis component of it better access for cleaning. Not surprisingly, they include that the modification of the implant prosthesis really help in the treatment of perimplant mucositis. And here we can see very clearly, look at those perimplant tissues. Look at that inflammation, that bleeding. Look how angry the perimplant tissues look. Just by changing the prosthesis and no surgical therapy, we can obtain great resolution of that inflammation. What is the key component? Access to those tissues. Patients should be able to clean around prosthesis. So when we look at patients, when we look, do our rehabilitation, it should always be a combination of functional aesthetics. Depending on the patient, depending on the location, we could favor more one side or the other side, but we should always be looking at those. If we have a patient that is a smoker with bad oral hygiene, possibly with diabetes, what are we gonna be favoring more? We are gonna go for the function part of it. We are gonna go for cleansability. We know that this patient is a very high risk for perimplantitis. If we have patients that are compliers without systemic diseases, without history of periodontitis, maybe we can do prosthesis that are a bit more challenging to clean, but look a little better because we know they are gonna take good care of their implants. How do we do with this? It's a very critical component. We should simulate the missing dentition. And we have research nowadays that shows that different type of abutments, different type of contours of those implant restoration, they are more prone to pre-implant diseases. When we have an emergence angle for this prosthesis of more than 30 degrees, it's a significant risk factor for pre-implantitis. It probably has to do a lot with foot impaction, with bad restoration margins, with bad contours that are not cleansable. So we need to give a space for those patients to clean. And this is really related with the abutment. The longer that we have the abutment, the more room that we have to play with these angles. And this is a research that we published years ago that we were looking specifically at the length of the abutment and we realized a significant correlation between the marginal bone loss and the abutment height. And we realized being here in the y-axis how the, the shorter the abutment, the more marginal bone loss. When we increase the length of the abutment, here we have four millimeter, we see how more marginal bone loss decreases. So the height of the abutment, it is one of these components that play a role. What do we do with longer abutment? We are separating the connection for the bone and we are giving more space for the pre-implant soft tissues to be there. Now, our group research, we are currently having another article, a systematic review on the influence of the abutment height 
as far as uh, uh, pre-implant bone loss, and we realize we have this is preliminary data, but we have seen how marginal bone loss it decreases as we increase the abutment height. And this is not only because of the height of the abutment. There are many different factors that we've been talking about. It's about the contour of the abutment. It's about giving a space for the soft tissues, for the supracrystal attached tissues that we talked about. So we have another poster of Spain by a group of uh, Juan Blanco that we realized in the exact same conditions, thick peri-implant tissues with different type of abutments, we can see a huge difference as far as bone loss. Here we have the three millimeter group and here we have the one millimeter group. With regard to the type of connections, and this is something very critical to talk about, we have mainly three different types. We have uh, two different types, internal and external type of connections. Um, and within the internal type of connection, we have different geometries. We have hexagons and we have different type of geometries, so we have conical connections. Uh, and I'm not going to spend uh, a lot of time into this because we have evidence that shows that internal connection works better as far as maintaining the pre-implant bone. Especially conical connections, those connections tend to work better. What is the question whether or not we use platform switching? I believe platform switching can help tremendously as far as maintaining the pre-implant bone. They're giving more space to the soft tissues. And more importantly, we are distancing, we are separating that connection from the bone, from the pre-implant bone. We don't have a connection touching our bone. We don't have a gap where bacteria can live touching our bone. However, we need to understand that platform switching does not do miracles. Marginal bone loss is a very complex multifactorial phenomenon. And we need, we can use platform switching being mindful of the other factors. This is again with the research performed by Thomas Linkovicius out of Lithuania. And they had 80 patients, 80 implants restored with platform switching. And they divided these patients into thin and thick pre-implant tissues. Not surprisingly, when they were looking at these implants in the long term, and they were looking at this marginal bone loss occurring around these internal implants, they realized quite a bit of a difference between thin and thick pre-implant soft tissues. In the thin group, we can see how marginal bone loss is significantly greater than around the thick group. But not only that, it continued increasing over time. We went from 0 0.7 to 0 0.9 to 1 point almost 2 with the thin group. And these are platform switching implants. But on the other hand, on the thick pre-implant tissue group, we can see how it remains stable over time. We go from 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 and maintaining that 0 0.2. So does platform switching works? Yes, it can work once we control the other factors. And as we saw before, the presence of thicker, longer pre-implant tissues really helps maintaining the pre-implant bone. What about retention? Screw retain, cement retain restoration. We should go for screw retain as much as possible. A very simple reason is that we are avoiding the presence of cement in the oral cavity around pre-implant tissues. We know that the presence of excess cement is a significant risk factor for pre-implant disease. And when we remove this cement, we can have disease resolution. So if we have the possibility of not using cement around our restoration, why will we choose to use it? It is okay to use cement restorations as long as we prevent as much as possible the excess cement coming to the brain implant tissues. But if we can prevent it, if we can use a screw retained restoration, why would we choose to go for cement retained restoration? And that's part of the presentation. And I wanted to talk about the maintenance part of it. Once the implants are placed, once the implants are restored, what do we do with our patients so we don't have a huge amount of pre-implant diseases? We know that supporting implant therapy, we have more research in the last year, and we know that it's a great, great component for pre-implant diseases. Here in this paper, they conclude that inadequate information or motivation, what we were talking at the beginning of the presentation, is one of the main patient reported reasons for non-compliance. So when we don't have motivation, when patients don't know about pre-implantitis, they are not gonna be proactive to come for maintenance. They are not gonna be proactive to have good oral hygiene. They need to know, they need to be informed, they need to be motivated.
This is another research comes uh, from Spain, from Alberto Monge, when they were looking at the association between maintenance, between compliance with this maintenance therapy and the presence of perimplant diseases. And they divided patients into patients that comply with the maintenance therapy that they proposed or patients that didn't comply. We can see how the regular compliance, almost three out of four patients have pre-implant health and only one out of two patients have pre-implant health for the non-compliance. But more importantly, when we are looking at the presence of pre-implantitis, we see how little, only 5% of the patients that comply with supportive pre-implant therapy have pre-implantitis. Only 5% of the patients. When we look at non compliers 25% of the patients, five times as much. So we know that patients that do not comply with maintenance are much more prone to having pre-implantitis. The conclusions from this study were that compliance was indeed associated with 86% less conditions of pre-implantitis. Finally, the pre-implantitis maintenance compliance at least two times a year, it is crucial on the preventing or pre prevention of pre-implantitis. Does that mean that our patients should come twice a year? No, it depends on the case. It depends on all the other different factors that we've talked about. Maybe some patients will benefit for three times a year. Maybe some patients, certainly some patients will benefit from four times a year. It depends on the case, on the host factors, systemic factors, local factors. We need to determine what is a good supportive pre-implant maintenance therapy for our patient. And that can be changed over time as patients understand and progress. What we do when patients come for supportive pre-implant therapy, we take radiographs, we do charting, we look at those implants. And very importantly, if we see pre-implant inflammation, we treat pre-implant mucositis before it progresses to pre-implantitis. Once we have pre-implantitis, once we have big defects that the implant on the left side, that is a much more complex to solve, we should prevent that problem from happening. So we probe prondenal implant. There is really no more discussion about this anymore. We should probe dental implants. We can create minimal damage, minimal separation between the soft tissues and the different implant components, but that is repair within days. Within five to seven days, the pre-implant mucosa is back to where it was before probing. So yes, we should probe around dental implants. What are the things that we do during the pre-implant maintenance? How do we measure pre-implant health? There's many different tools that we are looking at. We are looking at the probing depths around dental implants. We're looking at bleeding on probing. We are looking at redness. And of course, we are looking around suppuration. Most of these tools, they lack or they are not very good in one of the factors, whether it's sensitivity or specificity. We should be doing different measurements. We should be looking at different factors. And we put all of these together we will be able to better determine how we can measure whether it's pre-implant health, pre-implant mucositis, or pre-implantitis. A single probing depth around a dental implant, it really gives us very little information. Six millimeter probing depth around a dental implant can very well be a healthy implant or can be an implant presenting with pre-implantitis, depending on all the other different factors. Are the soft tissues bleeding? Are the mucosa very red? Do we have suppuration? So we should be looking at this variety of factors. With regard to maintenance, there are really many different tools that we can use to clean our implants. Uh, we have non-surgical therapy, we have a Capitron, we have ultrasonics, we have uh, uh, plastic uh, tips, uh, we have uh, metal tips. Um, there is really a great variety of tools. Uh, what we should do, we should be um, knowledgeable. We should know how to use the tools that we are using. And we should be cleaning our implants as much as possible with causing the least amount of damage to the implant surface and to the prosthetic part of the rehabilitation. So we should clean as much as possible, creating the least amount of damage as possible. How do we do this? It doesn't really matter. We can use a great variety of tools as long as we clean as much as we can and we cause the least amount of damage. 
finally, this is one of the uh, papers published very recently in 2020. Uh, that once again, in the same uh, same way, that we have this uh, this uh, risk assessment tool around teeth. Uh, the same tool has been published around dental implants, and here it tells us uh, what is the risk of our patients uh, for for preimplantitis, and, and this is aimed obviously at the prevention of preimplantitis, so we can classify in our placing into high risk, moderate risk, or low risk. And these are some of the, the factors that we've been looking through these presentations. They are looking at the prosthesis, they are looking at the history of periodontitis, they are looking at the uh, susceptibility. These are the different factors so we can classify whether our patients are at high risk or low risk for preimplantitis. So as a conclusion uh, for today's presentation, hope we learned that, that there is a very high prevalence of preimplantitis and the treatment of preimplantitis even though we have seen a lot of presentations even though we have seen a lot of beautiful cases on social media even though we have all have cases where we have regenerated bone around implants it is really a very challenging it is a very challenging disease and we know very well how to regenerate around teeth but uh, the resective and regenerative therapy around implants it tends to not work very well, especially in the long term. Um, prevention, it is really the key determinant for the long-term success of dental implants. Instead of seeing how good we are at treating preimplantitis, why don't we change our mind and we see how little preimplantitis as possible can we have in our offices? And finally, preimplantitis and marginal bone loss it is a multifactorial approach. There is many different factors playing a role in every single patient, in every single implant. We cannot control preimplantitis just by one single factor. It has to be a holistic approach. When we look at the host, we look at our patients, we look at surgical factors, prosthetic factors, and we pay very close attention to maintenance. And with this, I want to thank you very much for your kind attention and for the invitation. And I'll be happy to have any, any questions if, if there are any. Thank you very much, Fernando, for your uh, really impressive and informative uh, presentation. I think we will have some time to take questions. Uh, we'll start from here, from Dr. Fagnejad. Okay. 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 Uh, hello, dear Dr. Fernando. Uh, Hi, Suarez. Really thank you for your great uh, presentation. We all enjoyed your uh, great notes on this um, challenging topic, uh, the preimplantitis. Uh, as you mentioned, there are many uh, important factors that we can uh, consider to prevent uh, this uh, condition to happen. Uh, but uh, I wanted to know what you do for treatment of these cases, most likely in your office, uh, what is your approach? You uh, mostly go to resective surgeries or uh, regenerative or the combination of these two uh, modalities? Well, that, that, is a, that is a great question. That could be a, a, a whole presentation, a whole entire presentation. Uh, what I do is most of the times um, I do both. Uh, I try to do both. Uh, as we know, uh, regenerating when we have an um, infrabony component, 
especially when we have different walls, uh, three, four walls, it is, uh, it is it can be a predictable um, therapy. With the supracrystal um, defects, I, I, I definitely not try to regenerate. Um, the more that I've been treating cases of preimplantitis, I have to tell you, the more I do uh, resected therapy. I, I still believe that doing regeneration around dental implant is, is much more challenging than doing regeneration around teeth. So if I see there is a, a defect that is very uh, amenable for regeneration, I, I certainly try to regenerate. But other than that, I, I, I do quite a bit of resective therapy. And that is one of the reasons why I focus so much on prevention because with resective therapy, uh, we can stop perimplantitis. We, we can make the bone loss stop, but it, it doesn't look too good as we saw in the, in the first few cases. Uh, one of the things that I have changed um, in the last couple of years is that I try not to do as much uh, implantoplasty as I used to. Uh, the more than we know about the topic of titanium particles and the more than we know about implant surfaces, I, I, I wonder more and more if it is worth the, the amount of damage that we are causing to the implant, the amount of particles that we are releasing to, to the pre-implant tissues. Uh, does it really make a difference in, uh, when we do that, that implantoplasty? So, and, and we do have some research uh, coming up that maybe implantoplasty is not as critical for the for the long-term outcome after resective therapy. So that is the one thing that I have changed more recently. And I tend not to do as much implantoplasty. Like six, seven years ago, I will do implantoplasty to almost all cases. And nowadays, not, not so much for sure. Thank you. Thank you a lot. You're very welcome. So there is a, one more question from one of the audience asking, what is the best method of simulating preimplantitis on implant surfaces in vitro? Which kind of bacterial culture would you suggest? That is a very difficult question and there is really not that I'm aware of. I don't know the answer to that. And I doubt there is any evidence to prove that we actually have evidence on the other way, uh, as far as, for example, ligature induced preimplantitis, we know that when we place the ligature, even without bacteria in an sterile environment, just by the trauma of that ligature, we will have bone loss around implants, even without bacteria. So bacteria is just one of the ways that we can lose bone around dental implants, but it's not the only one. And many cases that we see preimplantitis, bacteria is the consequence once we lose bone, we are gonna have more colonization of bacteria with more aggressive bacteria, as we saw. But many times bacteria per se is not the cause of losing bone. Sometimes it is, it is preimplantitis is certainly always a campaign. It, it always has uh, bacteria, but it's not always the consequence. As far as what is the bacteria to specifically induce more bone loss around dental implants, I, the, the, the answer is it, it, it's a group of bacteria that is not, uh, a single bacteria that I will say, of course, we know the typical names of the bacteria that will cause the more bone loss, but it's, it, it's a complex environment where a, where a group of bacteria are more detrimental than others. As we know, anaerobes, gram negative bacteria that we were talking about, those are certainly more detrimental to the peri implant tissues. Thank you very much. So Dr. Moslemi also has a question. She is the famous Moslemi which we know the paper by her 2011, comparing the outcomes of CTG with allograft, alloderm, in mm -hmm. terms of the outcomes of root coverage. Thank you, dear doctor. And thank hi. you for your, hi. Thank you for uh, your comprehensive review of the articles about the peri-implantitis. I really, uh, uh, that it was really useful for me. Thank you. I have a question about the, the, the method of, of the detox, the disinfection of the implant surface in cases you want to use uh, regenerative surgical therapy. Uh, is there any method of choice for, uh, uh, for disinfect the implant surface? Well, <laughs> that's a great question too. Um, 
that as, as, as we saw a little bit, in the same way with maintenance, when we do maintenance around dental implants, we have many different tools. And not only tools, we have many different uh, products that we can use. Some people use uh, tetracycline powder. Some people use chlorhexidine, citric acid. Uh, we did publish um, a review on this topic, and there is really no difference. Uh, a lot of different speakers and a lot of different uh, clinicians have different recommendations. As far as what I do when I'm treating perimplantitis, the same thing happened. I have... I have changed quite a bit over the years. And when I was treating perimplantitis, um, I don't know if you're going to still hear me. I think something changed. Can you still hear me? Yes, yes we yes. do. Ah, okay, let me go. So um, years ago, I used to do a very, very complex treatment for this. I used to detoxify with, uh, with, uh, with manual cruets, and then I will use ultrasonics and then I'll use chlorhexidine, and then I'll mix uh, the bone graft with tetracycline. And then all very, very many different tools and many different ingredients to that. Now they have realized that as long as you detoxify the implant surface, you remove that bacterial colonization, that plaque around implants. So I use uh, mostly manual curettes. I don't use ultrasonics as much. Every now and then I do, but I use mostly manual curettes. I like to use chlorhexidine around the implant surface, and then I perform my bone graft and uh, with membrane or, or whatever method I'm using for the regeneration. But as far as detoxifying the implant surface per se, uh, mostly manual instrumentation, ultrasonics if needed, and then I particularly use chlorhexidine uh, around the implant surface, and that's it. What about the titanium brush? Do you use it routinely? I have used it and I'm, this is just my experience. I'm not talking about evidence. I'm, I, I feel like I can clean better with the titanium brush, uh, well, not with the titanium brush, with the manual instrumentation. I feel like I can control better uh, how much force I apply to the implant surface. I feel like I can uh, clean a little better around those, uh, the different threads of the implant, but once again, I, I do have quite a bit of colleagues and friends that they use the titanium brush and it works great from them. So I, I think as we were talking at the very beginning of the presentation, I think as long as you clean the surface as much as possible, it doesn't really matter how you do it. It's just a matter of, of personal preference. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much again. You're very, very welcome. My pleasure. So Fernando, there was another question. Uh, would you consider any role of so-called occlusal overload, whether in initiation or triggering preimplantitis? Well, there's a great question. And uh, as we know, there is uh, quite a bit of controversy. I, as far as occlusal overload causing preimplantitis per se, if everything's looking great, patient is cleaning, prosthesis is great, um, everything's looking great. Just by having a little bit of a closer overload, I don't think that per se will cause periimplantitis. I think more likely we'll have some other of mechanical complications. Uh, we have a screw loosening. We have uh, different parts of the prosthesis breaking. Now, if we have plaque accumulation, if we have some other factors in the presence of a closer overload, that can certainly be a factor that we can lose more bone or we can lose bone quicker. In a, in a more rapid progression. As far as occlusal overload per se, uh, causing bone loss, I, there's certainly controversy around this topic, but I doubt that. One of the things, and I talked about it very briefly because this is really a, a big, big topic. This is a full other presentation. Uh, the release of titanium particles. Uh, today, even though there is controversy, there is more than enough evidence to prove that we have more particles around disease implants. And then implants certainly contribute to, to peri-implant inflammation. If we have occlusal overload in that connection, that micro movement between the abutment and the implant surface, we can have more release of these titanium particles. And those can certainly contribute to the presence of inflammation. And, uh, and of course, uh, peri-implant mucositis and peri-implantitis. Thank you so much. So I also have a question. Uh, getting back to marginal bone loss, uh, I would like to uh, learn about your uh, idea. What do you think about the role of uh, micro threads extending to the platform of the implant? Do you think they would uh, have a role in creation of marginal bone loss or do they prevent 
marginal bone loss as some companies claim that. So what would you think? Well, and this is just my opinion. I, I don't think they help into maintaining the pre-implant pre -implant bone. I think as we talked today, there is, a, there is a lot of different factors that play a role. Uh, the prosthesis, the positioning of the implant, uh, the pre-implant tissues, the height of the pre-implant tissues. I think the micro thread, they don't really help into preventing the bone loss. Uh, if you do the exact same in the exact same situation, same patient, same condition with, uh, with and without micro thread, I don't see we will see any difference. But I do not use those micro threads. I don't like to use them because something happens once you have bone loss. Those micro threads, I believe they do help into, into pre-implant bone loss to, to occur and those are very difficult to clean. So in my personal experience, I do not like those micro threads on top of the implant surface. If I could choose today, I will possibly go back in years Massimo Simeon talking about mix a hybrid type of uh, coronal part of the implant being a turn implant and the and the, the apical part of the implant being a, a rough surface. Uh, if anything, I will be more inclined to use those type of implants than the micro thread. What do you think about this topic, Dr. Koska? Well, well, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, also, on, uh, in terms of having a hybrid design for the implant, I think we have had it before, but with external connection for three eye external implants. So they had the first three threads of the implants as a turned surface, and then the rest was uh, a rough surface. But I don't think if it was a really, really successful experience. But maybe with new surfaces, but with uh, new internal connections, maybe it's worth trying again. I think so. I think so. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, I really appreciate this job and uh, I would like to thank you uh, on behalf of my colleagues in the uh, department and as the director of the postgraduate program in this department. I really appreciate. I, I don't know how much I had uh, told you about Iran, but we have a lot of uh, scientific events in the field of uh, periodontology or implantology, for example, uh, annual meeting of uh, Iranian Academy of Implantology or Iranian Academy of Periodontology. Uh, and I would like to invite you uh, lively, not uh, on web, in one of these mm -hmm. in very, very, uh, yes, very close uh, future. Uh, of course, I know that because of these circumstances uh, caused by this damn COVID, uh, we have some uh, obligations and limitations, but I hope it will be soon, uh, everything uh, back to normal. And in advance, I would like to invite you to one of these events and of course, I would like to thank Wahid because of, I know that without his sincere cooperation, it uh, would have not happened this lecture. And as uh, Dr. Moslemi said, uh, it was a very, very comprehensive and very, very informative uh, review in uh, implant dentistry and in uh, preimplantitis. And as you know, uh, preimplantitis is a very challenging uh, subject in the implant dentistry, and I, mm, I'm sure that it, the treatment or the uh, reason of the preimplantitis is still a mystery and challenging. Uh, I would like to know your opinion about, uh, we have Dr. Albergson about uh, four or five years ago uh, in uh, annual meeting of implant, uh, uh, Academy of uh, Implantology in Iran. He presented an idea about that, and he believed that uh, it's a new concept, of course, uh, that uh, the preplantitis is the cause of antibody, is a cause of uh, immune response of the body to an antigen. You know that? I would like to know what's your idea about this. Okay. Well, Thank first, you. I think, 
Thank you very much for your for your kind words and uh, and thank you very much for the invitation. It will be really be a, a pleasure for me You're to welcome. go. I will be uh, I'll be happy to to collaborate. Um, with regard to the question, I I unfortunately I have to completely disagree with his theory. I I have read the papers very closely, and it happens to be that I'm doing a lot of research. Actually, that was my thesis uh, many years ago about titanium particles and pre-implant diseases. And indeed, you can have a, he claims that when we place the implants, we have a, a foreign body reaction that, that, that is happening. That is the consequence on bone loss. In, in my opinion, also integration is, is quite the opposite from foreign body reaction. Could we have a foreign body reaction around implant? Yes, we could have that. And we could have that around titanium particles, but not around the whole implants. That could happen in, in certain type of conditions in the, a patient reject the implant. There can be allergic reaction, but those are very specific, very rare cases. As far as the, the pre-implantitis that we are seeing in our patients, some of the cases that I saw, a foreign body reaction, it is, it is quite the opposite from also integration. And I have read these papers very carefully. I have read uh, first I would like to point out with all the respect that most of these papers are opinion papers. These are reviews, not so much evidence-based. And they base their theories in, in a few histological samples that those can very easily be misinterpreted by different other types of cell population. They claim to be seen foreign giant cells and those could easily be some other type of cells. You cannot claim just by simple histology that that is what is happening. So I have done some research into this and I, unfortunately, it is hard to disagree with such a name in implant therapy, but I, I do not believe in, in the foreign body concept as far as, uh, could it happen? Yes, but in very rare occasion. Pre-implantitis, I don't think it's a foreign body reaction. And there are many things that don't really add up when you think about this closely. And this is a topic, I actually have presentations about this. Uh, if you guys wanna hear about this, we can do some other time. But I, I unfortunately I, I have to disagree with him on this. One hundred percent, or agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you again, and I hope to uh, to see you in Iran. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Fernando. So I want to add a sentence. I think uh, Albrechtson and some other clinicians who uh, back him up, like Hugo de Bruyne, they have a point. And what they mean is that we are going to have marginal bone loss, no matter uh, how it's caused. Well, of course, they say it's a foreign body reaction. But I think the point is that uh, not all the marginal bone loss that we see need the pre-implantitis treatment. Well, of course, that's true. But at this time in 2021, I think we have enough knowledge, enough information to even prevent marginal bone loss and bring it down to zero. Absolutely, 100% agree with you, Bahit. Absolutely, so, and I... Yes. Yeah, no, no, what I wanted to say is that I, I absolutely agree with you. And this is one of the things that I, that, I, that I wanted to show in the presentation is that marginal bone loss doesn't mean perimplantitis. We can have marginal bone loss without perimplantitis, but we cannot have perimplantitis without marginal bone loss. So if we don't have marginal bone loss, we are preventing perimplantitis. When we lose a little bit of bone, that very well can be stable for years and years and years. But if we prevent that bone loss, we will for sure not have pre-implantitis. And once I agree, I, I need to thank you again for the for that book chapter that you did for the book that we were talking about, thank specifically you. talking about, about marginal bone loss. And I would recommend everybody to read your chapter because very thoroughly you discuss uh, about this topic and how we can prevent that marginal bone loss and what is the relationship with pre-implantitis. Because as you said, just because we have a little bit of bone loss doesn't have to be treated. We can have bone loss without being pre-implanted. It's just some marginal remodeling. But today, we have the knowledge to prevent this bone loss that we've been told that is normal, but we can prevent it. Yeah, I think definitely now we have a lot of information that we could use in our daily practice to really minimize the marginal bone loss and bring it down to zero millimeter. Of course, Absolutely. it's not going to happen in all cases, but it's just 
we're talking about the percentage. Absolutely. And having Absolutely. more success in our practices. Absolutely. Any, any other question? So. Uh, I could tell you, I enjoyed your informative lecture, but thank you. Question. Uh, what's your opinion about uh, laser for cleansing the surface of the fixture? Do you prescribe in your experience? Excellent. Well, that, that's a great question. Um, I think lasers is, is certainly a tool that is uh, very popular lately as far as cleaning the implant surface. And I believe is, is one of the methods that can clean the implant surface, not only for peri-implantitis, but also for peri-implant mucositis. But I, I believe, in my opinion, what I was saying before, as far as decontaminating the implant surface is just one of the methods. Um, it can work great, but I don't think it worked any better than, for example, manual therapy or ultrasonic or different other tools. Uh, does it work? Yes. But it's something that I have used in, in research, but I do not use in, in, in daily practice. Because yes, it works, but it also have some other disadvantage that maybe some other instruments don't have. It, the laser is it's a bit more difficult to control and it can really damage the implant surface depending on what implant surface. Sometimes I've, I've seen the implants are almost disintegrate when, with that lasers and we can damage the pre-implant tissues. It also have a decontamination effect of the pre-implant tissues that some of the manual curettes don't have. But today um, we have research that saw that yes, it works. But when we compare lasers with some of the methods for detoxification, um, I think they work just the same. So lasers are perfectly used uh, to be used, but I don't think they have a great, great advantage over any other therapy. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Suarez. You're very welcome. Of the university, uh, any other question? Uh, on behalf of our university, a certificate uh, prepared, and this is honor for me, uh, presented to you, uh, return your kind assistance. And uh, I have to appreciate a kind effort made by uh, Dr. Shaki, the Deputy of International Affairs, and Dr. Milani, uh, who made uh, the best to assist us. Uh, Dr. Suarez, I hope uh, we can see you again in future and uh, I hope it would be an introduction uh, of the similar series talks and we can continue uh, this comprehensive uh, interaction with you. Excellent, thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear Fernando. As I said, I can't thank you enough. You know, on, in a weekend, this time too early in the morning, we really, really appreciate it. We look forward to seeing you here. And I look forward to seeing you and giving you a big hug, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I wish security and health for you. If you are possible, goodbye. Excellent. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. I want to see our department as you be, as you may be aware. Now we are a periodontics department of Tehran University. And so our residents yes. were enthusiastically yeah. listening to you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have Thank a great you. Bye, day. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.